Good morning, everyone. We're Lee and Macarena Abels. Um, please open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. And I would now invite you to stand in the reverence of the reading of God's word. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Ahora bien, aún el primer pacto tenía ordenanzas de culto y un santuario terrenal, porque el tabernáculo estaba dispuesto así. En la primera parte, llamada el lugar santo, estaba el candelabro, la mesa y los panes de la proporción. Tras el segundo velo, estaba la parte del tabernáculo, llamada el lugar santísimo, el cual tenía un incenso de oro y el arca del pacto cubierta de oro por todas partes, en la que estaba una urna de oro que contenía el mana. La vara de Aarón que reverdeció y las tablas del pacto y sobre ella los querubines de gloria que cubrían el propiciatorio de las cuales cosas que no se pueden ahora hablar en detalle. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing the ritual duties, but into the second only the high priest goes and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings Regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Y así, dispuestas estas cosas, en la primera parte del tabernáculo entran los sacerdotes continuamente para cumplir los oficios del culto. Pero en la segunda parte, solo el sumo sacerdote una vez al año, no sin sangre, la cual ofrece por sí mismo y por los pecados de ignorancia del pueblo, dado el Espíritu Santo a entender con esto que aún no se había manifestado el camino al lugar santísimo, entre tanto que la primera parte del tabernáculo estuviese en pie, lo cual es símbolo para el tiempo presente, según el cual se presentaban ofrendas y sacrificios que no pueden hacer perfecto en cuanto a la conciencia al que practica ese culto, ya que consiste solo de comidas y bebidas, de diversas aplusiones y ordenanzas acerca de la carne, impuesta hasta el tiempo de reformar las cosas. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctified for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Pero estando ya presente Cristo, sumo sacerdote de los bienes venideros, por el más amplio y más perfecto tabernáculo, no hecho de manos, es decir, no de esta creación, y no por sangre de machos cabrios ni de, ni de becerros, sino por su propia sangre, entró una vez para siempre en el lugar santísimo, habiéndose obtenido eterna redención. Porque si la sangre de los toros y de los machos cabros y de las cenizas de los becerros rociadas a los inmundos santifican para la purificación de la carne, cuanto más la carne de Cristo, el cual mediante el Espíritu Eterno se ofreció a sí mismo sin mancha a Dios, limpiará vuestras conciencias de obras muertas para que sirvan al Dios vivo? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Let's pray. Um, dear Jesus Christ, we love you so, so much. And we're so thankful because today, this day, we don't have to sacrifice any animals or do any sacrifices like the ones that um, used to be before uh, you came to save us. But you, God, and uh, you, Jesus, came came to this world and you gave your blood to save us. Um, we love you so much. And we just pray that today, Pastor Nathan, um, just speak the truth, your truth, and that we can hear you, God. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Living Stones family. It's good to be with you guys this morning. Uh, also want to say a special good morning to those of you, uh, our brothers and sisters at the South Reno Living Stones Church. Uh, it's an honor to be able to have you join us for our sermon this morning. Uh, as you guys know, we love you. We are praying for you. We are for you. Uh, we are so excited about all that God is doing in South Reno. Uh, we love Pastor Ryan and Adam and Josh and Daniel and, and all of the leadership there. Uh, you guys are just incredible people and, and you're in our thoughts and our prayers through this difficult season. Uh, but I'm excited to be able to continue this morning in our sermon series in the book of Hebrews uh, that we're calling Out of the Shadows. Uh, and today we move into chapter 9 verses 1 through 14. And for the past few weeks, the author of Hebrews has been showing us all the ways that Jesus is a better high priest than the priests of old and, and has been showing us how he ushers in a covenant that is better than the covenant of old, a new one. Uh, today, he's going to show us now that the worship of God made possible by Jesus is better than the worship of old. He will show us the ways in which God's people worshiped in the old covenant and how those were only a shadow of what was to come. You see, in the old covenant system of worship, the, the lives of God's people would be lived daily in light of the sacrifices that were needed to atone for their sins, and rightly so, right? God is holy. Our sin must be dealt with if we're to be in His presence. And therefore, God set up a sacrificial system uh, by which the blood of animals would foreshadow the reality that unless something innocent dies, unless blood is shed, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Something had to pay the debt. Something had to atone for the sins of God's people. And these animal sacrifices, although temporarily, as we've talked about a ton over the last few weeks, they did just that. Now, before I continue, I want to give us all the main point of my sermon this morning. Okay, the big idea, the thing that I want you to remember if you forget everything else that I say, remember this. The main point of my sermon is this. It's two parts and we'll talk about each one of them. But part number one. Jesus paid it all. And part number two, all to him we owe. So Jesus paid it all and all to him we owe. So the first thing that we'll see in verses one through the beginning of verse 14 is that reality. Point number one, Jesus truly did pay it all. Meaning, the debt of sin owed, the judgment that we deserved for our sins, the penalty of death that we should have paid, was paid in full by Jesus Christ and by His sinless life lived on our behalf. His sacrificial death on the cross in our place to atone for our sins and in His resurrection and ascension, showing us once and for all that He is in fact God. Now, 
As the author begins to show the people what exactly has been accomplished in regards to their old ways of worship, uh, we see an interesting reality in them and, I would argue, in us that I think is worth addressing, and we'll do so in just a few minutes. But what I want to do now is I want to read these verses again in their entirety, and rather this morning than go verse by verse in great detail, uh, we'll look at each one of them from the air, if you will, as the author is doing, and then we'll zoom in on some parts to, to talk about some interesting things, okay? So first, if you would follow along in your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 9, let's read verses 1 through 10. It says this, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold in which was a golden urn holding the manna <clears throat> and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties. But into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of the Reformation. Now, <clears throat> in verse 1, we're told that the Old Covenant had regulations for worship, and some of those are listed here, which, by the way, the Scriptures still give us today. Uh, the, the things that God desires in worship of Him, things that we adhere to and obey. And, and this is pointing us to the reality, church, that unlike the pagans of this day and age, the true God of Israel could not be worshipped just however the people wanted, okay? But, but there were, God was specific in how worship of Him was to happen. There were regulations given by God. Now, further, God was to be worshipped not only in a specific way, but in a specific place, uh, which is called the tabernacle or the tent, okay? And even this tent was to be built in a specific way, which God laid out. Uh, each of these specifications that God lays out here was intentionally revealing truth about who God was to His people, Okay, it wasn't just a mistake, it wasn't random, it was very intentional. Uh, for example, they showed that the one true God of Israel is a God of decency and order. He is not a God of chaos or randomness or changing like the pagan idols were. Okay, there are regulations in worship. Uh, in verses 2 through 5, <clears throat> we're reminded of the tabernacle, this tent of worship, that it was constructed in a specific way, laid out by God, and that was the place where God asked that worship and sacrifices uh, be performed. And, and as you look into the tabernacle, as the author <clears throat> excuse me, leads us through the text, uh, we see that everything inside the tabernacle had a purpose. Everything reminded and pointed the people of God to truths, again, about God and His holiness. I mean, the tent, the tabernacle itself, pointed to God's transcendence above and beyond the people, His holiness. I mean, when they would see the tent or the tabernacle, they would be reminded, just in seeing it, of God's covenant that He had made with His people. When they saw the tabernacle, they would remember that covenant that was made. 
Then the furniture and the items that were placed inside the tabernacle were all there also to remind God's people of different things, all of it to fuel their worship of God. Uh, Dr. Moeller says this of some of the items. He says, Aaron's staff reminded God's people how he preserved them in the wilderness and how he chose Aaron for the priesthood. Uh, the tablets of stone, of course, reminded the people that God had given them the law and that they uphold their end of the covenant by obeying God's law. The golden urn holding the manna inside reminded the people that God fed them and kept them alive during their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. It reminded them that God alone is their provider, that God alone is their sustainer. The Ark of the Covenant reminded them of God's love and faithfulness toward them, His presence with them. I mean, even the cherubim, these angels that were guarding the Holy of Holies and, and the golden altar, even they were pointing the people of God to a bigger reality. You see, gold in the ancient days, and we know a little bit about gold uh, here in northern Nevada, uh, but gold in the ancient days was the most valuable commodity. And so this picture of, of, of the regulations of, of gold being used in the worship of God and on the Ark of the Covenant that these angels are surrounding them, this is a picture of the immense value, more than gold, that God placed on heaven and heavenly worship. It was to be the most valuable treasure to the people of God. You see, all of these things the people of God were to see and engage with when they worshiped. They were to see and remember, to stand in awe, and then enter into worship. But even still, only the high priest could enter the most holy of places, the most inner part of the tabernacle, and even he could only enter there once a year. And he had extra rituals that he needed to perform to purify himself, to be able to enter the place where the presence of God would dwell. And of course, he did this on behalf of all the rest of the people. The high priests would purify themselves and then they would move beyond this giant curtain or this veil that separated the place where common people could go and the most holy place where only the high priest could go and offer sacrifices. There was, in the worship of God, a separation. And everything was designed to show the separation between God and man and all that was necessary to bridge that gap between us. All the work, all the rituals, all the bloodshed, all the death, pointing us to the reality, God is holy. We are sinful. Even the priests in verses 6 through 10, which we read, when they would go in and offer sacrifices to atone for the sins of the people, they had to address three different realities, three different aspects of sin, okay? Now, we usually think of the first two, right? The sin of doing something we shouldn't have done. That's one. We also think of the second one, the sin of not doing something that we know that we should have done. But here in the text, there's a third category mentioned that the priest also had to address in his sacrifices. And that is the unknown or unintentional sins of the people. They all had to be atoned for and, and addressed before the Lord. You see, when I read that church, here's what I take away from that. God is that holy and we are are that sinful. Now, as you can tell, there was a ton that had to be done by the people and priests in their worship of God. And yet, the people were glad to do it, okay? Like, they were glad to do this. Glad to have been given a way in which their sin could be atoned for, that they might be in right standing with God. They were grateful for this. They knew that what they deserved was judgment and what they were getting was mercy and grace. They knew this. Now, with everything that I just talked about being your life, I, wa I want to ask you to use your imagination for a second. Imagine living that way. You, 
me today. Imagine living that way. Living in that old system. Living in that old covenant. Okay. And then being told one day that all of it, all of it had been replaced and done away with because of the actions of one man. Which, by the way, was explicitly told to them last week in chapter 8. But imagine that. Imagine being told that everything that had defined your life, everything that it had defined the life of your people and nation for generations was suddenly over. I mean, I can imagine the different things that I might think or feel if I was told that. Like maybe it's just, it's too good to be true. How can I trust that? How can that be? And yet, church, that is exactly what the people of God were told. Look at verse 11 through the beginning of verse 14. He says it again to them. Verse 11. So all of the things we just talked about, now look at verse 11. It says, but... When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, and not by means of his own, or I'm sorry, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood." Boy, there's a shocking statement to read, right? But by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Think about, think about that word. I mean, everything that they've been doing so far has been temporary atonement. Now they're told that the blood of one man offered in place of the animal sacrifices secures an eternal redemption. Imagine hearing that. Verse 13, it says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works? Let's stop right there for just a second. They are told that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done for them now himself what the entire old covenant system was pointing to. It has happened. It has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. They're told that Jesus is the truer and better high priest who does his work of atonement for sinners, not in a tent or a tabernacle made by hands like they're used to, but that, that, that tabernacle that was a shadow of heavenly things, but that this new high priest does his work in heaven itself, in a heavenly place. The blood shed that cleanses mankind, not temporarily anymore like the animal sacrifices before them, but forever <laughs> is the blood of the Son of God himself. Think of that. I mean, the presence of God that was once closed off, separated from the common people, has now been opened wide in Jesus. Now, through faith in Christ, all may boldly approach the throne of grace themselves, having been washed clean by the blood of Jesus. I mean, this is earth-shattering, life-changing news that they're hearing. I mean... We remember, as recorded in the Gospel of John, that Jesus said, it is finished on the cross before giving up his life as a sacrifice for sinners. You know, those three words, it is finished. What was finished? All that was necessary for sinners to be cleansed forever. All of the work was done. Jesus, church, has paid it all. It is finished. There is now a new covenant in His blood that atones for the sin of His people forever. When I read that, I think of the communion meal in the upper room before the cross where Jesus pours the wine and passes it and tells the disciples, this is the blood of a new covenant, blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This has happened. 
The Gospels even record for us that a giant veil or the curtain that separated the common people from the presence of God was torn in two from top to bottom on the night that Jesus died. It was finished. (laughs) Nothing separates us any longer. In fact, God's presence, God himself, has come to us now in Jesus Christ. This is good news, isn't it? This changes everything. This is a better covenant, a better high priest. I mean, we we celebrate this truth every year. It's that big of a deal. We celebrate it every year at Christmas, right? I mean, in the prophecy of the birth of Jesus, what, what are we told? What does the angel say God's son's name will be? Well, it says his name will be Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Finally, God with us. And I mean, even after Jesus ascends to heaven, after his resurrection, he gives us his Holy Spirit. I mean, it's fulfilling the promise that not only is God with us, but he will now by his Spirit never leave us and he will never forsake us. (laughs) This is good news. There's nothing anymore that God's people need to do for salvation, to have our sins atoned for, but trust in Jesus. Jesus has paid it all. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that as we talk about this, something kind of comes to the surface that that I think we should address. Uh, And and I want to do that right here. Uh, In hearing this, I think that that many of us today, and, and even back then, certainly, many of us struggle in fully trusting what Christ has done on our behalf. We struggle to believe that it's really enough. Maybe you're watching this video and, and, and you're not a Christian, but you're just kind of investigating this. What are all these people doing? Who is this Jesus that they're following? What has he really done that, that has changed the world? Well, well, this is it, okay? This may be uh, the kind of roadblock in your life Uh, that makes trusting in Christ difficult. And just know that you're not alone. I've wrestled with this for years, okay? A lot of us have. The people around you have. But but here's the reason that we can struggle with believing that it was enough. Uh, It's this. It's because we love to have control of our lives, don't we? Like, we love to be in control as human beings. We love to know and believe that somehow we are playing a part in the most important aspects of our lives, right? This is so true. And and it doesn't change in regards to our faith and worship either. You see, we as human beings tend to place greater trust in things that we can see with our own eyes and, and touch with our own hands, right? It's because we can feel more in control. Uh, Dr. Albert Moeller again mentions that this is actually one of the reasons that God's people held on to the Old Covenant with such high regard, why they struggled often with the new. It's because not only did God give the people a way to have their sins atoned for, but He also let them participate in it. (laughs) He let them get their hands dirty and see the inner workings of what it took to temporarily atone for their sins. And because Israel was able to participate, it gave them a sense of certainty that at least for the time being, their sins were covered. They were atoned for. But now in Christ, do you see this? The new covenant, they are removed completely from the equation. They're not a part of the atonement anymore. This is because the forever atoning work of Christ has nothing to do with sinful humanity. It has nothing to do with us. We don't add anything or contribute anything to God's saving of His people forever in Jesus Christ. We simply believe through faith in all that Jesus has done for us. To be a Christian is to believe through faith that Jesus paid it all. So that's what it takes. To to be a Christian, to be forgiven of your sin, is to relinquish all control of your life 
to Jesus Christ. It's to surrender to Him, to surrender to His love, to surrender to His mercy and His grace. It's to, through faith, acknowledge that you cannot save yourself, but Jesus can, and through His life, death, and resurrection, has. That's what it means to be a Christian, to believe that Jesus paid it all. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that our worship of God stops now in the new covenant. It doesn't stop. It simply changes. It gets better. And let me show you this, okay? We're told in verse 1 through 14, the beginning of 14, that Jesus paid it all. But now look what we're told in, in five critical words in the last half of verse 14. It says, all of verse 1 through 14, then it says this at the end, to serve the living God. So in other words, you could sum up chapter 9, verse 1 through 14 by saying, Jesus paid it all. Now what? All to Him we owe. All of this was done so that we might serve the living God. All of Christ's work is to free us from our bondage to sin so that we might serve Him in a new and better way. You see, we don't worship like the people of God used to through sacrifices and rituals now, but now we worship Him through our entire lives. You see, our worship now is a personal and communal relationship with God. Okay, it, we worship God in the way that we love others around us, believers and those who don't yet believe. We worship God when we're generous to God and to other people. We worship Him in the way that we live life in community, shining the light of God into this dark world. We worship in the way that we gather together like we're doing now, however we can, and sing praise to God, open up the scriptures and hear from Him. And we worship when we take the sacraments and we remember His love for us. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 12 verse 1 that our bodies, everything that we are now, are to be presented to God. I love the language here. He says, as a living sacrifice. He says, that's our worship. It's not a one-time thing done once a year anymore with an animal, something outside of us. Now, because of Christ, our existence is the living sacrifice. We offer all that we are to God in worship every moment of every day. It's a relationship now. That's so much better than the old. Jesus paid it all. And so all to Him we owe. We now, as God's people, are forever free. We're forgiven, cleansed from our sin. Now we live in that freedom and in that joy of following Jesus. We can't help but, but share His message with the world that they might too know freedom and joy and forgiveness like we do. All of our lives are lived in worship of Jesus. This is the new covenant. It's better worship than that of the old. We give ourselves wholly and completely and forever to Christ who bought us from this world with His own blood. In Jesus, church, we are loved, we are forgiven, and we are made whole. Jesus paid it all. So now, all to Him we owe. This is the good news. This is the whole story of the Bible. True freedom and joy in life is only found in following after Jesus. I want to close this morning with a story um, that I read uh, a couple years ago that I really felt illustrates well uh, what our relationship with Christ looks like now in this freedom and joy that He has purchased for us. Uh, in the blood of this new covenant. And uh, this is a story that I've shared with my staff many times, but it's something that just, it touches my heart deeply and leads me into worship every time I hear it. And so I want to share this story and then I'll pray. But the story goes that Abraham Lincoln went to a slave market 
And uh, he noted there a beautiful young African-American woman who was being auctioned off to the highest bidder. And Abraham Lincoln bid on her and he won. And he could see the anger in the young woman's eyes. And he could just imagine what she must have been thinking. Great, just another white man who will buy me and use me and then discard me. But as Lincoln walked off with his property, he turned to the young woman with a smile on his face and he said, you're free. Yeah, what does that mean? She replied. Lincoln said, it means that you're free. She said, does that mean that I can say whatever I want to say? Yes, Lincoln replied, smiling. It means that you can say whatever you want to say. Does it mean, she asked incredulously, that I can be whatever I want to be? Yes, Lincoln said, you can be whatever you want to be. Does it mean, the young woman said hesitantly, that I can go wherever I want to go? Yes, Lincoln said, it means you are free to go wherever you want to go. Then the young woman said with tears welling up in her eyes, I think I'll go with you. Church, Jesus paid it all. He set us free. We'll never know love like that. It's found nowhere else in the world but in Jesus. This love and this freedom. Jesus paid it all. So now, all to him we owe. Living Stones, Elko, South Reno, may we be a church that is known for our service to the living God. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you, God our Father, for sending Jesus to save us. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to leave your throne in heaven, to come into this broken, messed up, chaotic world, and to live perfectly the life that none of us could ever live. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to sacrifice your own life, to shed your own blood to die the death that we should have died, that I should have died. Jesus, thank you for dying in our place. And Jesus, thank you for conquering death, for rising again, proving that you are God, that everything you've said and done is true. And thank you for giving us the freedom to live life to the fullest as we look to you and as we worship you. God, thank you for being our hope in this chaotic world. Thank you for being an anchor that holds us down when when the winds of this world want to blow us and cause us to drift away from who you are. God, would you keep us close? Would you help us to set our minds on Jesus? You paid it all. So God, all to you we owe. Help us now as we sing, as we get ready in a moment to take that meal that reminds us of this new covenant. Fill us with joy. Help us to raise our hands in worship of who you are and what you've done. It's a better worship after all. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen.